If you've ever been curious about Linux, but didn't want to set up a dedicated machine to experiment with it, you're in luck. Today in Dave's Garage, we're going to take an in-depth look at how you can run Linux and Windows side by side on the same hardware at the same time. Some things don't just go together very well, like nuts and bubblegum. But other combinations like Linux and Windows can be even greater than the sum of their parts. Perhaps it's best explained with this old TV ad. I'm taking my windows for a walk down the street. Strutting with my Linux. Boom! You got your Linux in my windows. Oh no, you got your windows all over my Linux. Cool, but who's this creepy dude and why is he in our business? All right, he's gone. Go ahead. Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. I'm Dave Plummer, a retired software engineer from Microsoft, and I worked on every operating system from MS-DOS through Windows Server 2003 and XP. It might surprise you then to learn that today's topic is all Linux, and yet it's also about Windows because today we're going to look at how to easily run them side by side on the same machine at the same time, giving you the best of both worlds. Now, given my involvement with Windows itself, it might surprise you to hear me advocating for integrating Linux into your workflow, but it's really no more surprising than the lengths to which Microsoft has gone to embrace Linux in the last several years. It's all about having the right tool for the right job. And if there's anything that's proved true out here in Dave's garage, it's that you can never have too many tools to select from. Now, I first got started with Unix in the late 80s, and I dabbled with Minix and then Linux in college as far back as about 1992. That was even before I wound up at Microsoft, which is really where I got my first exposure to Windows itself. So, in some ways, I was using Linux before I was even using Windows. Either way, it's been about 30 years of both, and so at least I've gained some perspective from having used both for a long time. But the last operating system that I was religious about was probably Amiga DOS, so I'm not going to advocate for one over the other. Like I said, I use the best tool for the job at hand, and that means that on any given day I might record an episode with OBS under Windows, and then edit that video with Final Cut on the Mac, and then do some LED coding with Visual Studio Code under Ubuntu. On the PC, I run Linux and Windows at the same time, using a hypervisor that divides the hardware between them. This is the architecture employed by the Windows subsystem for Linux, better known as WSL. Now, WSL is shipped in two flavors, version 1 and version 2. Version 1 was fun and all, but it was a virtual machine running deep inside of Windows. A Linux system call thus had to be translated into a Windows executive call, which would in turn call the Windows kernel, which would call the hardware abstraction layer, which would then ultimately talk to the hardware itself. As you can imagine, that's a lot slower than just talking to the hardware directly. With WSL2, the Linux kernel is not virtualized under or by the Windows kernel. In fact, they are now peers of each other. The Windows NT kernel and the Linux kernel run at the same time on that same machine, and each one talks to the hypervisor layer. That technically makes both Windows and Linux into virtual machines running under a Microsoft Hyper-V, but talking to the hardware through a hypervisor is much, much faster than running in a conventional virtual machine. The performance difference between running on the bare metal versus against a hypervisor should be as little as somewhere between 2 and maybe 10%, depending on the nature of the task and how much, if any, overhead results from the hypervisor itself. But there's no excuse for guessing, so I tested Linux on the bare metal versus Linux under WSL2 and compared it to Windows under the hypervisor as well. More about that later. Before we can get started, however, we need to somehow change our conventional Windows installation into a hypervisor-based setup and then add at least one Linux distribution as a second operating system. That sounds like it could be a complicated bit of work, and indeed it used to be. But on a fully updated Windows 10 or 11 machine, however, it's just a single command to take you from WSL0 to Hero. So let's get started. The first thing we need to do is to open a command line prompt. And since we're going to make changes to the system configuration, or more aptly, WSL setup is going to make them on our behalf, we need to run this prompt as Windows Administrator. We could at this point run a simple command, WSL double dash install. That would install WSL2, download Ubuntu from the Microsoft Store, and install it all automatically. And that is what we're going to do. But in case Ubuntu isn't your favorite flavor, let me show you how to see the chef's selection of the day. To get the current menu, you run WSL, double dash list, double dash online. That will produce a list of all the distributions that you can currently install right from the command line. And if you wanted to get fancy, you could provide your own tar file for your distribution, but we'll do two of the online ones as examples. First, I'll install the default Ubuntu, and then I'll add Kali Linux. Now, I'm told that merely installing Kali Linux will give you some serious street cred with the opposite sex at the hacker conventions. 
but you could also try installing Debian or any of the other distributions listed as well. When I execute WSL install, it will first install the Windows subsystem for Linux. You could have done this through the Windows Features applet, but this command line tool does it all for you. Next, it will automatically download the Linux distribution that you specified, or if you did not specify, as noted, it will default to Ubuntu. Behind the scenes, we've just installed a new kernel and a hypervisor to go underneath Windows itself, so a reboot will be required to get this all up and running. When the system comes back up, it will configure features for a moment, and then it should be ready for our use. If we run the Windows terminal, we now find a new entry for Ubuntu. If we select it, it will start up Linux. Because this is the first time Linux is run, it will take a few extra seconds to get going before it asks us for a new username and password. I use the same username as I do under Windows, but there's no requirement that you do so. And by the way, if and only if you're trying to do this all within a VM somewhere, that effectively means you'd be running a hypervisor under a hypervisor, and it's possible, but you need to enable nested virtualization on the actual VM for it to work. To make that work, you need to run a PowerShell command on the host machine where the VM lives. Set dash VM processor, and then the name of your VM, and then dash expose virtualization extensions, true. And again, you only need that if it's a VM inside of a VM, but you will get stuck if you try it, so I thought I'd throw that out there. For everyone else, here we are at the Ubuntu prompt, but we're not done yet. We can install as many Linux distributions as we like, so let's add Kali Linux to the mix. To do so, we simply go back to the Windows side and run WSL dash dash install dash dash Kali dash Linux. We already have WSL installed, so it does not need to repeat that entire setup. Rather, it simply downloads and installs the Kali distro, and a few seconds later, it's ready to go. When we launch Kali, it knows absolutely nothing about the windows around it or the Ubuntu installations running beside it, and it asks for a username, just like Ubuntu did. Again, you can reuse that same username or pick a new one, whichever you prefer. Once Kali is ready, it also becomes available from the terminal menu, or you could launch it from the Windows Start menu directly. At this point, we've got two complete Linux installations running on our machine as peers of Windows, all directly talking to the same hypervisor that each thinks is actually the real hardware. It's important to keep your Linux installations up to date, and the essential tool for doing so is known as a package manager. First, we'll update the software databases, which is a little like connecting to Windows Update just to see what's available for updates. We need to do this as super user since we're updating the operating system. That means we preface the command with sudo. While a lot of folks seem to think that sudo has something to do with a pseudonym, I think it's actually a lot simpler. Sudo probably stands for super user do. Just a guess. The package manager is called apt, and so to update the list, we run sudo apt update. That will turn away for a bit online and ultimately return with a list, just like Windows Update would, telling us what is available for updates and how many there are. They won't actually be downloaded and installed, however, until we run a separate command, sudo apt upgrade. Depending on how many packages it has to download and update, this process can take anywhere from a few seconds to several minutes. APT can also be used to install optional software such as the Apache web server. Installing that is as simple as typing sudo apt install apache2. And once the web server is installed, you can launch it as a service right on your machine. sudo service apache2 start. And then to connect to the web server and test it, you do need to know your IP address, which you can retrieve with the ifconfig command. Depending on which distribution you're running, you might have to install the nettools package to get that command. Once it's installed, you can simply run ifconfig and look for the IP address. When you have the IP address of your WSL system, you can enter that into a web browser, even on the Windows side, and get access to the web server that you just created with a single command line. So hosting a web server is a great example of something that's really simple to do under Linux, but generally requires a lot more setup and configuration if you were doing it under Windows. Once you've got both Linux and Windows side by side, you've really got the best of both worlds, and you just kind of get used to using the best tool for the job at hand. So if you're going to edit an image in Photoshop, you would use Windows. If you want to host a web server or database or do some command line processing, Linux becomes your go-to choice. The servers and command line tools are all well and good, but you're no longer limited to just the command line under Linux with Windows WSL 2. If you want to run graphical X Windows applications under Linux, that's also fully supported. To make sure you've got the latest and greatest WSL 2 that includes that graphical UI support, run the command WSL dash dash update. That will pull down any version that's newer than what you have and perform the upgrade. At this point, we could just stop and play with all of our favorite Linux command line tools like sed and awk and grep. But you could do all those things under Windows if you installed the little tools, so let's take a minute to do some of the things that are possible only with graphical Linux.
Now we should walk before we run, so let's try some simple graphical X Windows applications like Clock and Calculator to make sure everything is working as expected. To install the simple graphics apps, we run sudo apt install x11-apps and I'm going to add "-y", to answer the prompts affirmatively. Once complete, we can run the clock as a test by entering xclock into the command line. And for the X-Windows calculator, you guessed it, it's xcalc. As you can see, these are fully graphical applications that run side by side with our other windowed applications on your desktop. But we're not limited to little utilities like calculators. We can install a much more substantial package like Audacity, the full featured sound editor, the same way. sudo apt install audacity. You might even find that many Linux applications wind up nicely integrated into the start menu. For example, we now have Audacity on the start menu and it's listed as launching under Ubuntu. When we select it from the Windows start menu, it launches under Linux and then fires up its main window on the desktop. As an example to play with, we can load a simple WAV file into the Audacity editor. <laughs> This is the sound file that plays when the perimeter monitors on my property are triggered and you might recognize it from the old game Berserk. Which is also, coincidentally, how my dogs act when they hear it. I was surprised at first to discover that sound is fully supported under Linux. Apparently, the sound hardware is a device that has been virtualized for access by all the hypervisor clients and they all share access to it. You can also install applications like free office suites and so on, but if you're running alongside Windows, you're probably not ready to displace all your desktop apps like Word and Excel quite yet. But if you want to though, the options do exist. Similarly, if you don't want to invest in an expensive package like Photoshop, you might want to consider software like GIMP, which is a fully featured and very powerful image editor. We can install it easily as follows. sudo apt install GIMP. And then, like all the other applications we've installed, you can simply launch it from the console. And finally, a look at using Visual Studio Code. Microsoft has done something quite interesting with VS Code. They've split it into a back-end server and a front-end desktop UI. That means the core of it, or the guts, can run in your Linux system and the UI, meaning the actual editor that you're working with, can run somewhere else, like under Windows. It even works across entirely separate machines, but its best use, I think, is when you're on a local machine with both Windows and Linux. It's truly one of those, and I know I keep saying it, the best of both world scenarios, as you get the full desktop experience of Windows combined with the power and versatility of the Linux kernel. Best of all, it can, in some cases, even net you a significant performance benefit. On my Windows installation, building our Night Driver LED project from GitHub takes over a minute, but under Linux it can take as little as 12 seconds. This isn't necessarily a problem with Windows, as when you monitor the system you discover that under Linux it's making use of all my cores, but just a few of them under Windows. The platform I.O. tools that I'm using were developed under Linux, and so that's what they're optimized for, and that's where they run best. To show how simple it can be to write and test code in this way, let's create an empty folder with a single main.cpp file. I'll then edit the file, add my normal include statement, and then define a brief little main function that just prints hello world. To make life simpler, I'm going to install a single extension called Code Runner, as it does the plumbing for us when it comes to invoking the right compiler for the right source code. In our case, it's going to use GCC to compile and link our application and then run it, which simply prints hello world to the console, but it took us mere seconds to get up and running with the code, so again, right tool, right job. Once we have VS Code running, note down in the bottom left that it says Ubuntu 20.04, which means the core of VS Code is actually running under Linux. The UI is running on Windows, and then it tunnels through to connect back to the back end. You can use this visual indication to keep track of what you're actually running on. And finally, a hot tip on how to share your serial ports over Linux. This is important if you're going to do any microcontroller development, for example, since you need to flash the chip over serial. It doesn't matter how good the dev environment is if you can't actually flash the chip at the end. So to do this, we need a package called USB IPD. This is a software package that allows you to share your USB ports across the network, and we're going to use it to share the serial port down into Linux so that I can flash to it directly without having to go back to the Windows side. We get USB IPD from GitHub, and there's a handy MSI installer there ready for you to run. We run the installer, and once it's complete, we need a console window. The hardest part is likely figuring out which USB device it is that you plan to share. In my case, I know it's called Serial Converter B because I learned that by just unplugging things to see what disappeared from the list. First, you need its bus ID, which you can learn with the command USB IPD WSL list. I can see that my device is listed as 18-2, and so to share it down to WSL, I must run the following. USB IPD WSL attach, and then dash B 18-2. I'm also going to add dash dash auto attach, 
The auto attach at the end will run the command in a loop, reattaching the device automatically if somehow it gets disconnected, like if the microcontroller resets itself during the flashing process. Over on the Linux side, I can now run LSUSB to get a list of the available USB devices. I can see the FT2232 serial device in the list. Depending on your luck, one final step might be required. Setting the permissions on the port on the Linux side so that you can actually access it. The easiest way is to just take ownership of the port with a chown command. sudo chown, your username in my case Dave, slash dev slash tty usb1. What USB number your device shows up as depends on how many devices you actually have. In many cases it will just be tty usb0 under Linux. Finally, you might be curious about the raw performance. Rest assured I did a complete set of benchmarks, comparing Linux natively on the Threadripper hardware versus under the hypervisor, as well as comparing the same benchmark between Linux and Windows, and then comparing both to the latest Mac Studio as well. If you'd like to see those results, be sure to give this video a thumbs up so I know there's some interest in this WSL topic, and I'll put together a desktop drag racing episode featuring the full results. And of course, make sure you subscribe to the channel so that you don't miss them when I do. If you have any interest in matters related to autism, Asperger's, or ASD, please check out my book on Amazon, Secrets of the Autistic Millionaire. It's got nothing to do with money and everything to do with living a successful life on the spectrum. It's basically everything I know now that I wish I'd known back then. Remember, I'm mostly in this for the subs and likes, so please be sure to leave me one of each before you go today. In the meantime and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage.